to welcome you here today. I'm so excited to be worshiping with you uh, and, and exalting our Lord together as the music and song is being played. Will you just lift your heart up in exaltation to our Lord? I'm excited about the days that are coming ahead on June, June 14th. We'll be having our drive-in service and uh, locally we'll be worshiping together in an altered form, albeit, but then we'll also seek to provide uh, you with online, uh, an online venue to worship as well. Uh, again, welcome and let's exalt the name of our Lord together. We've seen what you can do, O oh God of wonders, your power has no end. The things you've done before, in great measure, you will do again. And there's no prison wall you can break through no mountain you can move all things are possible there's no broken body you can raise no soul that you can save all things are possible the darkest night you can light it up
awaken your people, come awaken the city, oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out, every stronghold will crumble, I hear the chains of the ground, oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. So I think that during this time, as there's so much that's unknown, and we have to kind of go day to day wondering when, when things are going to go back to normal and when things are going to change. Um, as we sing through this song and we sing, it is well, and we sing, through it all, my eyes are on you, um, let this be a time where you can just really check your heart and worship, thinking, where have my eyes been? Where are my eyes going to be? Because it's definitely not too late to think through how we're going to respond or continuing to respond to this crisis and through this pandemic. So sing with me as we sing, it is well through it all. Seas that are shaken and stirred 
I'm so glad to be bringing you the Word of God today. Uh, what an honor it is when there are uncertain times and difficulties in our lives, when uh, things are confusing and questions are swirling, that we can come to the Holy Word of God and find uh, answers and find wisdom uh, and the words of life which are living today. So as we look into God's Word, let me invite you to turn to Philippians chapter 2, where we're getting to one of my favorite passages of, of all Scripture, where it speaks of the greatness and the grandeur of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we live in uncertain times. It seems as though uh, everything is changing and circumstances are moving around, the news cycles are going, and life is uh, unnerving at this point. I think oftentimes we look at circumstances around us and we think, could it get worse? And then it seems to devolve even more. I'm speaking specifically about the events here in our own country where our nation is reeling with the effects of, uh, of what's happened, the, the death of three African Americans in close time period, um, in very difficult circumstances, and then the, the, the polarized reactions to that. Our nation really is becoming more divided, it seems, and rather than united, and we see the painful effects, we experience the painful effects. And if you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, have had your heart broken and torn at all of this and uh, that has happened, uh, then I know that you are walking in the Spirit because you are affected by the, the gravity and the far-reaching consequences of sin in our lives, but also in this world. And so, as that plays out before us, I think it's an illustration of the importance of being a people together. Paul has been focusing on that throughout the latter part of Philippians chapter 1 and throughout the first part of Philippians chapter 2. We are to be a people who don't get in the way of the gospel since it's unstoppable. Instead, we are to be a people united, standing as one, side by side, shoulder to shoulder, fighting the enemy who is uh, Satan himself and those who join forces with him. And, and fighting with the gospel of Jesus Christ and getting the word of God out. That is our mission. And so our spirit, the, the sort of attitude that we are to have with one another, ought to be a spirit of unity, a spirit that prefers one another over our own preferences. And in chapter 2, Paul gets to that. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Have the mind of Christ. And then he tells us what that mindset is. Jesus humbled himself, really humiliated himself. He took open shame, all of the shame of the cross itself, uh, not only becoming a man and, and not only subjugating himself to being a creature, uh, one that, that, was, that was born into this world, but, but now even to the point of death, even death on a cross. God, uh, in the infinite wisdom uh, and in his divine plan, was making a way for us to be reconciled back to him. Our sin broke this relationship with God, and God in his mercy, even before the foundations of the world, had given over his son, Jesus Christ, the perfect lamb of God, and, and was now in this uh, recording of, uh, or, or I should say in this account of Philippians, is now giving and offering up his son for us. And Christ suffered that sin and shame on our behalf. Now, if Jesus took that sort of approach for us, Paul's arguing how much more should we not also take that same approach with regard to our brothers and sisters in Christ? Shouldn't we be thinking of them, preferring them, listening to them, honoring them, giving up our rights if it benefits them, leveraging what we have for their advantage? That's the point Paul is making here in this passage. But the story of Jesus... His humiliation and his death on the cross doesn't end there. And Paul makes an abrupt shift. He makes an almost transitionless uh, turn in this passage. And it says here in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and following, Therefore God highly exalted him, or has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him, that's on Christ the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven 
and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I love this passage. Now we see not just Christ crucified, but now Christ risen. Christ uh, ascended into heaven and exalted to his rightful place. I think in our lives we think, see things as 1 Corinthians 13 says, we see things so shrouded, so veiled. We see things dimly. We don't see all of the circumstances that are happening out in, in our lives and in our world. We don't see them quite rightly ordered. We don't know how all the puzzle pieces fit together. And we don't even see Christ and in, in his mission and his work fully or clearly. We might bemoan the fact that some got to see Christ after he was risen. And you might say, I wish I had a glimpse of the risen Christ. Then it would be easier for me to believe when circumstances around me seem confusion, confusing and questions around me arise. But I want to I want to submit to you today that we get four glimpses of the risen Christ in this passage and urge you to, in faith, uh, look to, listen to, and believe these words. Four glimpses of the risen Christ. The first glimpse is of the exaltation of Christ. Verse 9 says, therefore God has highly exalted him. That word therefore ties in from the previous words. Uh, Jesus lowered himself. Jesus humbled himself. Jesus didn't retain all the rights and privileges, all the amenities of being God, the praise and the glory, uh, incessant glory of the, of the angels, the, the comfort of heaven. Instead, he became a human for us, he became a man for us. And it's because he willingly, voluntarily subjected and submitted himself that God has now highly exalted him. So that is why God highly exalted him. Since he was obedient to the Father's plans, since he didn't hold tightly to the praise and glory he rightfully deserved, since he humbled himself, since he despised the shame, all of those reasons combined together now remind us of why God has highly exalted him. God the Father pictured here in this verse. Humiliated at the hands of men, exalted by the hand of God. This is the contrast. And that's the contrast that Paul wants us to see. Well, you might be humiliated. You might be ridiculed. You might be caused to endure shame for following Christ. But just as Christ was highly exalted by God the Father, so one day you too will be raised up and will be esteemed in the presence of the Lord. So, therefore, God has highly exalted. And that word in the original language literally can be translated super exalted. Christ is already exalted, put on, uh, set at the right hand of God. This assumes, of course, the rest of the story that after Christ's death on the cross, Jesus came back to the life by the power of God and then was ascended into heaven 40 days later and then seated, as it says in Colossians 3, seated at the right hand of God. So it's assuming all of this in that seated at the right hand of God is showing his exaltation, his being placed in his rightful position of glory and honor. Uh, one translator put it this way, God raised him to the loftiest of heights, to the highest of heights. In fact, this word is so superlative in, in the Greek, it's really hard to render it in an unawkward place in, or, or in an unawkward way in English. It means uh, exceedingly exalted him or uh, raised from the lowest of lows to the highest of heights, to the highest possible degree. It's reminiscent of Psalm chapter 96, verse 9, where it says that God, the, uh, God the Father, God is exalted far above all other gods. When the Old Testament was translated into the Greek uh, language called the Septuagint, for those of you who are really excited, 70 uh, Hebrew scholars translating it into the Greek language. When that happened, this verse, Psalm 96 verse 9, used this word highly or supremely exalted. The exact word now that Paul uses to speak of Jesus, attributing full deity and full godship to Jesus Christ, the Son himself. How is it that Jesus could be exalted? And as A.T. Robertson, the great Greek professor said, not only exalted, but lifted him above and beyond his previous state of glory. How is it that Jesus, who was God in 
who is God from eternity past, could be lifted up and exalted to a place even above where he was before. If he was God, how could, how could even though he changed his state of being, how could he now have a, an exalted place? Well, let me seek to explain that for just a moment. When Jesus, who eternally was equal and one with God in perfect communion with the Father, prior to his becoming human for us, when he existed in that state, he had intrinsic value and worth, intrinsic glory and honor, innate worthiness or weightiness. What that means is just by virtue of being who he was, God, he was worthy of all glory and honor and power and prestige and dominion. All of that was rightfully his because of who he was. In, at, that's intrinsic worth and glory and value. But when God became man, when, when the son took upon himself the form of a servant, humbled himself, humiliated himself, died on a cross, taking all of the wicked shame of our sin, enduring the scoffing rude of every person there, and, and taking upon himself all of this on our behalf, he then ra was raised into his rightful place, uh, back in glory and now not only did he have intrinsic worth and glory now he has extrinsic worth and glory that is to say by virtue not only of who he is but by virtue of his action by virtue of his sacrifice by virtue of his incredible working and acting on our behalf now he is doubly due all the honor and glory therefore god exalted him far above He's received now not only the glory of God the Father, but will now receive the glory of man as we can relate to that kind of love and sacrifice and see how worthy he is, not just intrinsically for who he is, but also for what he has done. God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him, this is verse 9, the name that is above every name. God granted to him, a name symbol, uh, sim, uh, symbolizing the, the glory or the, the reputation, the, the right that he has to be exalted, the name that is above every name. An exaltation not only in the form of position, but now in the form of recognition. So because of his ex exaltation into the heavenlies, because he was placed at the right hand of God, the, the position of glory and honor and recognition and authority, but now he is also given uh, an exaltation in the form of recognition. This name which all will associate with glory and honor. It's a name now used by some when they curse, by some when they're frustrated or angry. angry. It's a name now, the name of Jesus, the name Jesus Christ, a name not recognized, not universally accepted, but it is a name that all will one day recognize and see as glorious and worthy of honor. As it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 22, it says that he worked, that is God the Father, worked in Christ when he raised him, when the Father raised him, Christ, from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. We see and catch a glimpse of the exaltation of Christ. But secondly, what we see here is the vindication of Christ. In verse 10, it says, so that, or as a result of Christ's exaltation, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow. Christ is being vindicated by the Father. The name of Christ, emblematic of the whole of who he is, his name representing that he is son of God and son of man. At this very name, every knee. That means not one excluded not one creature, not one creation, nothing that has ever lived or had breath, nothing and no one will fail to recognize who he is. No mighty king will be able to stand the sway of Christ's rule. No potentate or power will resist his scepter. He will rule as a, with a rod of iron, Scripture says, for those who are unwilling in this day and in this age to submit to him. No ardent atheist who denies his existence will stand in prideful denial and defiance at his lordship. 
No Wall Street tycoon will buy his way out of Christ's dominance. The very guards who forced him to the ground with their rods will now be ruled with the rod of iron, and they will bow to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords. Here is Christ's vindication. This one who subjected himself to utter shame, to scoffing rude, will now with absolute and unequivocal recognition be seen as the one whom God has highly exalted, and they will bow. Paul here in this passage is quoting Isaiah chapter 45, verses 22 and following, in which God says this, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. Isn't God an incredibly merciful God? How patient He is, how He waits for you, how He waits for His creation to come, and He, and he beckons, come, all the ends of the earth. Anyone, who, whosoever will, let Him come. Let Him come. Let Him confess. So He says, come to me all the ends of the earth and be saved, for I am God and there is no other. By Myself I have sworn, from My mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall... Uh, that shall not return to me every knee will bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance paul now is applying this lordship of god the father himself the creator of all this lordship and attributing that to jesus christ this exact uh, reference here from the old testament now applied to jesus as king of kings as lord and lord of lords remember jesus subjected himself voluntarily to obedience to the father and now what, what we see in Scripture is that God is exalting him. And not only is God exalting him, God is vindicating him. Remember what Jesus did? Isaiah 53 gives us a, a reminder. In verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hid their faces from. He was despised and we esteemed him not. People didn't see there was colossal shame heaped upon Jesus. There was intentional humiliation which he took upon himself when he endured the cross. But now, in retrospect, as if looking at the highlight reel, the author of Hebrews in chapter 12 reads to us or, or gives to us a picture of how Jesus saw things in the midst of that humiliation and suffering. Here's what the author of Hebrews says in chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Looking, that is to say, as we run our race, we are to be looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And then he goes on, do not grow weary, that is based on the actions of Christ as you're running, he looked to the cross and in, in endured what he endured even with the shame because he there was a joy that was set before him and and that's why he says Cons do not grow weary consider him who endured from sinners and such such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted the author of hebrews says don't stumble back to the old way and give up on the faith don't apostatize yourself if that were to be possible, even though we think better things of you, Hebrews 6 says. Instead, endure that shame because just as Jesus looked to the cross and endured that, that shame, he knew something was on the other side of that. He would be vindicated. So you too do the same. The resurrection of Jesus Christ by the dead, uh, from the dead by God the Father, his exaltation and vindicated him. Every word that Jesus spoke came true or will be coming true and so that's why every every knee will bow every knee it says in heaven that is angelic beings or saints gone before on earth that is those presently living uh, at the coming of christ and the establishment of his kingdom or uh, or all creatures inhabiting the earth those on the earth and those under the earth this perhaps could mean those who have died, uh, whether they died in faith or they died not believing in Jesus but have been buried. Or it could mean the demonic forces which uh, represent the, uh, the earth, if you will, but now are under the earth, hell being pictured by many in that day as being below the earth or at least pictured in, in that way. 
It could speak of all hell. So whether it be the angels in heaven or the demons in hell or, or any creature in between, if you will, uh, of anyone who has ever lived and any being that has ever existed will all bow the knee to him. He will be vindicated. All the demons who, seeing his beauty and his splendor and his glory, still resisted the lordship of Christ in heaven and in defiance rebelled and followed the evil one himself, they will bow. Every person who in pompous pride has ever said, I don't need God, I'll do this myself. Every person who's spat on the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every person who's said, I'll be the Lord of my life. I'll be the captain of my own fate. I'll sail the, I'll sail the seas of this life with me behind the helm. Every person will bow and Jesus Christ will be vindicated and seen for who he rightfully is. Revelation 5 verse 13 pictures this. John the Revelator writes, and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth, same language here, and in the sea and all that is in them, saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Those who hurled insult and, and shame upon him, those who wagged their heads and derided him, those who passed by and spat upon him, they will see. They didn't see then, but they will see now, and he will be vindicated. Jesus had prophesied in John 2 about his impending death. It says this in John 2, verses 18 and following. So the Jews said to him, what sign will you do for, show, for doing these, will you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. Now the Jews said to him, it's taken us 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scriptures and the word that had been that Jesus had spoken. So Jesus spoke about his resurrection and they didn't believe. But God raised him up and in his resurrection, God was saying, this is my son. He has full approval of me. Even before uh, he was crucified at his trial, before the high priests, as they were quizzing him on who he was, Jesus said this in Mark 14, verses 62 and 63. I, they asked him, are you, the, are you the Christ? He said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. Speaking about himself, you're going to receive me seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. You know what he was saying? In the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, it says that God is riding on the clouds. He says, you're going to see me coming back riding on the clouds. He was claiming to be God himself. And they scoffed at him and they mocked him. This is what they said in verse 63. This is Mark 14, 63. The high priest tore his garments and he said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard this blasphemy. They did not believe. But now, Christ, raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, exalted in his rightful place, is being vindicated by God himself. We see, thirdly, a glimpse of the subjugation of Christ. Not that Christ is subjugated, but Christ is the one doing the subjugating. It says, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee will bow, and that Christ will be vindicated, vindicated and every tongue will confess that he is lord everything will be subjugated to his lordship or to his rule every again not one power or being not one with the greatest might or one who is the meekest will escape his lordship and they will all see every mouth will be stopped and every tongue will be employed by god the father to attribute all dominance and power, all prestige and all submission to Jesus Christ as Lord. And they will bow and they will speak. They will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. They will speak the truth. Their tongue will utter, you are Lord and to you I bow. Today we have the privilege of rightfully and and presently honoring him as savior and lord but one day those who have not acknowledged this will do the same but they will do it not voluntarily 
but they will do it by coercion. They will confess, openly declaring and publicly stating that Jesus is Lord. That Jesus, the earthly name given to him at birth, the one uh, whose very name means the Lord is salvation, and he would enact his very namesake through the crucifixion on the cross. Jesus Christ, meaning the anointed one, the promised one, the Messiah, and Lord, supreme ruler over all. Everyone will bow and speak and confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Interestingly enough, for the Jew, when they heard Jesus is Lord, they would understand that was a claim that Jesus was on par with, equal with, and coexistent with God the Father himself, that he was divine. The reader would know that this was the terminology used of Yahweh God in the Old Testament now applied to Jesus. There was no question that he was God in human flesh. And for the Roman citizen, when they heard Jesus was Lord, they, they would understand this was a rival claim to the, to the lordship of Caesar, who, especially under the rule and reign of Nero, during this time when Paul is writing to the Philippians, and he claimed that as a title for himself, Savior and Lord. They would see that Jesus stood as one who claimed all rights of all allegiances for all time, and Caesar had no right to that sort of claim only christ and so paul speaks to a future date when there will be universal recognition of christ's lordship and when he will put all things under his feet in luke chapter 21 when speaking to the religious leaders of his day in verse 43 jesus is speaking about the the passage from psalm 41 where it says that david talks about one who would put all things under his feet and 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 Jesus asks them, well, then who's David speaking about? And they did not have a word. But that word was answered about putting all things under his feet and making his enemies his footstool. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 27, it says God has put all things in subjugation under his, under Christ's feet. And when it says all things are put under his subjugation, it is plain that he is not meant, all things are, uh, who put all things under subjugation to him. When all things are subjected to him, that is to Christ, then the Son Himself will also be subjected to Him who put all things in subjugation under Him, that is God, that God may be in all in all. So Christ will continue to keep the role that He has as Son uh, in obedience to the Father, but all things will be placed under His feet. In Hebrews, we see this glorious passage in verses chapter 1, verses 2 and following. But in these last days, God has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed as heir of all things through whom he also created the world he is the radiance of the glory of god and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power stop pause for just a moment this world's not actually out of control christ upholds all things by the word of his power the very universe all things are held together by him and after making purification for sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. Christ is over all things. Even the angels are under his feet. And finally, that brings us to this fourth glimpse of the risen Christ, and that is a glimpse of the glorification of Christ. So we have seen the exaltation of Christ the vindication of Christ, the subjugation of Christ, and finally the glorification of Christ. Verse 11, all of this results to the glory of God the Father. The word glory is the Greek word doxa. We get doxology from it or praise or honor. The, the word glory from the Old Testament speaks to the resplendent, brilliant display of God's perfection and beauty it's that outward manifestation of who he is he is glorious and perfectly holy and the glory that one saw was the outward expression of that and when people give glory they're attributing the truth of god's word that and of his worth and his weightiness and saying you are that great you are that glorious and it says here that jesus through his death through his exaltation now his whole life brings glory to God the Father. And what we see here is this beautiful 
perfect symbiotic relationship between the Father and the Son. That is, as the Father honors the Son, the Son honors the Father. And as the Son honors the Father, the Father honors the Son. It's this perfect circle of unity where, where they are both receiving the glory and honor. So in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus says, I praise you, Father. In several other places in the gospel, Jesus speaks of bringing glory to the Father. The exaltation and vindication and subjugation of Christ results in the glorification of Christ, which ultimately results in the glorification of the Father. So just as when Christ is rightly seen as glorious and high and lifted up, ultimately the Father is also seen as glorious and high and lifted up because He is the divisor of this plan He is the one who has enacted this supremely sovereign, beautiful plan to reconcile a broken, fallen, messed up, hurting world and bring it all back together again so that all things come from him and go to him. This is his glorious work. Christ is glorified when the Father is glorified, and the Father is glorified when his Son is glorified. In John chapter 8, verses 48, And following, it says, the Jews answered him, Jesus, are we not right in saying you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. The father seeks the glory of the son. And even though these in that passage rebuked Jesus and didn't see his glory, the father saw it and would glorify him. And as he glorified his son, the son would bring ultimate glory to him. In John chapter 12, in verses 20 and following, we read that many were going up to worship. um, And uh, in verse 21, it was uh, Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, asks him, sir, we wish to see, someone asks Philip, rather, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip says, to Andrew and Andrew to Philip, they go to verse 23, Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Now he's speaking about the cross. Isn't it interesting that the cross would bring glory through through his death. God would be glorified and the son would be glorified. Truly, he says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life so jesus is speaking of the self-denial which is typical of what a disciple is you can't live for your own glory you can't live for your own plans it's dying to self and in doing so you find your eternal life if anyone serves this is verse 26 of uh, of john chapter 12 if anyone serves me he must follow me and where i am there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now see, what I want you to get is this is the pattern for our lives, just as it was for Christ. Now uh, he says this, the Father will honor him. The Son of Man must be lifted up, a reference to the cross. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this very purpose I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The Father would be glorified as Christ was lifted up and glorified. Jesus said, I'm going to the cross and, and I will, I'm going to my glory. And the Father says, I'm going to glorify my name through you. This is perfect relationship when Jesus is recognized, the Father is recognized. And when we see the greatness of the Father, we're pointed to the greatness of Christ They are intricately intertwined. And the Spirit is always bearing witness. Father, Spirit, Son. Spirit is always bearing witness of the greatness and the glory of Christ. What is Paul doing here? Paul squarely and uniquely places Christ in the center of the everyday life of these Philippian believers. They were tempted to live out and pursue their own honor. They lived in a status-filled world where people were clamoring to be made known. Where, where even Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, wanted to be identified as great. Where they were tempted to follow the patterns of this world and make a name for themselves. 
where, where they were tempted to clamor for praise and seek recognition for people to see that they were distinguished and maybe a little cut above where in conversations they were tempted to make mention of all of their earthly accomplishments, where their own wisdom and learning and knowledge was, was sometimes put on display for other people to see and recognize. See, all of these very same things these Philippians were tempted to do, we find ourselves every day tempted for people to recognize and honor us, for people to see us for who we are, uh, uh, to scrap and fight even in conversation for some sort of recognition in our lives, for people to take notice, for people to see who we are. But Jesus humiliated himself and took upon himself scoffing shame from the very ones he created. He became a laughingstock, the single most greatest laughingstock of his day. He became a fool to the world in order to win our salvation. But God honored his son and raised him up and exalted him to the highest place, giving him the recognition that he rightfully deserved, vindicating him and subjecting all things under his feet and glorified his son and will continue to glorify his son until universal recognition of his intrinsic worth is seen by and given by all. This same order of humiliation and exaltation runs true for us as believers. Remember, Jesus was not looking for temporal exaltation. He was looking for what lied beyond this world, for the joy that was set before him. If he were looking for temporal recognition and honor, he could have succumbed to the temptation of Satan, who said all of these kingdoms will be yours, who said all the honor will be yours if you just bow to me. Instead, Jesus endured the cross, not taking the short-sighted allure of the moment, but looked to the end. Believer, you are called to do the same in your family to humble yourself, to put your needs and your rights and your right to be right in conversations with other believers and in context of your neighbors and in, even in the context of this culture to, to live out this hum, humble lifestyle, this meek lifestyle for God's glory and enduring whatever might come as a follower of Jesus Christ so that others will see that he indeed is Lord and trusting that God will in due time lift you up, even if that due time is not here and now in this life. So followers of Christ, we know that we're to live out our lives for the benefit of others, even with sacrifice, not living defensive lives, not protecting our honor, but sacrificial, willing to lay down whatever is necessary for the betterment of our brother and sister. Knowing in faith and believing in faith that God in his own economy has a way of making all those things right, that he doesn't miss a thing, that God is not unfaithful, but he sees your sacrifice and your service to him. And one day, knowing that just as Christ was exalted, that we will be co-regents with him. Scripture saying that we will rule and reign as kings and priests to our God. And that we are seated with him already in the heavenlies. We're already there. To put it kind of plainly, we've already got one foot in heaven and we're leaning in that direction. Listen to me, believer. That is faith. You can't see it now. It's shrouded. But we get these glimpses of the risen Christ and his exaltation. We say, in faith, we know that we're going to follow after him in that same way. And that those who humble themselves, God, though he resists the proud, he will give more grace to the humble. And, and God will, in due time, lift up those who humble themselves and lower themselves here and now. Finally, we have to remember that we in this life might experience shame and reproach for following Christ. People just aren't going to get you. They're not going to understand what it means to live a humble, meek, sacrificial life. Not a demanding life, not a forceful life, but one who lays himself or herself down uh, all the time at the altar of the cross daily and subjects himself or herself to the will of Christ for the betterment of others. And when we do that, we trust God is going to one day make things right and bring glory and honor to himself. It's ultimately all 
to the glory of God the Father. That's why you live this life. That's why you're here, is to bring glory to Him, not to bring honor and attention to yourself. And if you feel slighted, if you feel as though something's been taken away from you, if you feel as though you don't have the proper regard of people, you've missed out on why God has placed you here, just as Christ was willing to subject Himself to all of this for us, and ultimately it was for the glory of the Father. So whatever you might endure here, ultimately it is for His praise and His glory and His adoration. You are called to put your rights and your privileges, your desires aside for the glory of God. That is the spirit of all who followed Christ and set this example before us. Well, today you've heard the gospel clear and plain that Christ, who was God, became human for us, that we might be reconciled and brought back to God. And if you believe that, if you've staked your life's weight upon that, God will not forget. And He will one day raise you up and be faithful. And just as Christ was buried and rose from the grave, one day God will raise you up to new life. And He will give you uh, the due rewards uh, that that he's promised trusting that will you pray with me father we believe your word and just as you called your people 2000 or so years ago the philippian believers to a united perspective to one heart one soul one passion to be so intricately knit together that they're moving together as one unit in this world to bring about the glory of of God and to bring about the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So Lord, we pray that as that same body still lives here and and operates in this world, you would hear locally through this body and globally, Lord, bring your people together that we might seek not our own honor or recognition, but the glory and honor of Jesus Christ and the Father. So Lord, enable us, we pray. Grant faith for those who who feel as though their time has come and and it's not reality yet. Grant them faith to believe that you do all things well and you're going to make all things right. We'll trust you to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining us in God's Word. This is a glorious passage. Go back and read it. There, There are gems I didn't have time to mine out of there. Go back and read it again and remember that God is going to make all things new and He's in that process now. If you have some questions about where you stand with God or need someone to pray for you, there will be a contact card in the announcement slides to follow this video. And also on our website at nationalhillsbaptist.org, there's a place for you to fill out some information. We would love to know how we can pray uh, for you and serve you. Uh, If you'd like to give to the ministry, perhaps you've been watching over time and and you feel as though this has been value added for you in your walk with the Lord and you'd like to give to support the work of this ministry, both here in this local community of the CSRA, but also um, as it goes out across the the nations, we would encourage you to do, you can go to nationalhillsbaptist.org. There's a a tab on there to give and uh, the Lord, I believe, will bless you for that. Thanks again for joining us. May God bless you in the rest of this day. We look forward to seeing those of you who are local soon and very soon. God bless you.